Okay, well, um, I think I'm, I'm on the same page with Lucan. Um, and as Lucan, I view it primarily as the civil war that's... The um, yeah. And I think the conflict started initially as the civil war. Uh, and it basically became, I would say, an internationalized civil war, if you use the definitions common in political science. Uh, there is a discussion now whether we should term it as an interstate war rather than international civil, civil war. But I think an important thing to keep in mind is that initially it started primarily as an indigenous conflict. And uh, let me, uh, probably, if you can pull, pull up the map, uh, the first map, um, the very controversial map of uh, the National Geographic that was widely condemned in the Ukrainian diaspora, uh, which showed uh, Ukraine divided, uh, sort of this is the vision of Putin, uh, Novorossiya, Southeast, uh, Crimea is part of Russian Federation, and then, of course, the area of Donbass where the armed conflict is going on. And so, for me, the starting point of my paper is the argument that in order to understand such a complex event as the armed conflict in Donbass, and all civil wars are uh, extremely complex when we look at their origins, I think we need to disaggregate uh, the, both the conflict area and the area of Southeast in general. So the first thing that's important to keep in mind is that there has been no armed conflict in the Southeast. Uh, Kharkiv, Dnipropetrovsk very quickly came under Ukrainian control although there were attempts to capture government buildings there. And there were no serious attempts to capture government buildings in Odessa, in uh, Zaporizhia, in Kharkiv, uh, sorry, in uh, Kherson or in Mykolaiv. Um, only the events, uh, only in uh, Donetsk, in Luhansk, and in other towns of Donbass, the uh, attempts to capture these buildings were successful. Could you move to the second map? But of course, if you disaggregate it also on the level of the Donbass itself, you see that uh, parts of Donbass initially were, uh, for, for the entire period of the conflict, were under full Ukrainian control. So the northern parts of Luhansk Oblast uh, and the, sou uh, the south uh, western parts of Donetsk Oblast were not controlled by uh, the insurgent movement. Um, and the question is why? Why do we see such a variation in the ability of the insurgent forces to control these different towns. And just to fast forward uh, a little in terms of my argument, could you show the next slide? Um, so I looked up um, uh, at the variation in uh, the composition of different towns across Donbass. And based on the census of 2001, how many Ukrainians, native Ukrainian speakers are there in different towns of Donbass? And as you can see, most of the towns, and this is only 80 towns here that I uh, showed on the scare plot, there are more. Most of the towns where the Ukrainian cities, uh, where Ukrainian native speakers were over 80%, in those towns and cities, there was no control of the insurgent forces. By contrast, uh, all of the cities and towns where the Ukrainian speakers are below 20% are under control of the DPR, LPR. So for me, it really uh, says that in order to understand why the insurgents were so successful in capturing and controlling these towns, because the key to understand why insurgency is sustain, managed to sustain itself so successfully is to understand why the civilian population is cooperating and collaborating and complying with the insurgent forces. So for me to understand that is to understand the political orientations and pre-existing beliefs that pre-existed the conflict, that were not part of the conflict it itself. Um, but of course, um, I also agree with Lucan, uh, and so my explanation in the paper is, is based on uh, two elements, two levels. Uh, I agree with Lucan, Lucan that to understand uh, the insurgency, we need to understand the dynamics of the revolution. Uh, and for me, the beginning, the turning point in the revolution was the Hrushev conflict or, and the um, confrontation on the, on the Hrushevsky Street, where for the first time we, see, we saw that uh, uh, um, civ uh, civic groups get out of control of the elites, political elites cannot control uh, foot soldiers on the ground and protesters. And secondly, we are seeing direct confrontation and physical violence. Uh, and what that, what that led to was the serious 
the uh, one week long um, diffusion of protest to the regions where we saw that really the largest number of protests were happening not in Kiev itself, but in the regions. And Volodymyr Ishenko's uh, great analysis that was very helpful for my paper basically shows two things. So first of all, uh, after uh, January 19, uh, you had an increase, a substantial increase in the number of Maidan protests, pro-Maidan protests in other areas other than Kyiv. And secondly, most importantly, you see a greater prominence of uh, right sector and self-defense units in the protesters, uh, protesters themselves. Political parties as visible actors in the protests go down. The uh, right sector, uh, guys in masks and Molotov cocktails, their presence and visibility uh, goes up. And if you actually look at when the uh, Russian Spring started, so-called Russian Spring, it did not start in uh, uh, March of uh, first, or it did not start uh, with the Russian invasion of Crimea. It started in late January, uh, and it started as a response to the events in Lviv, in Lutsk, in Ivano-Frankivsk, Ternopil, where there were both captures of the government buildings and public uh, humiliations of the law enforcement, which sort of symbolized not only the implosion, uh, the rise uh, of prominence of the extreme nationalists, but also the implosion of the coercive capacity of the state. So for me, really, the first uh, uh, important factor is structural factor, the fragmentation of the state, where basically for over a month, the Ukraine, uh, half of Ukraine existed outside of the control of uh, the central authorities. And second of all, the, extent, the way in which revolutionary overthrow happened, the uh, visibility of the use of force uh, by both sides. Um, and that led to two things. First, um, uh, it led to uh, a substantial decline in the legitimacy uh, uh, of the new authorities. And particularly, that decline was prominent uh, in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. So only 10% of respondents in Donetsk believed uh, that the new government, Ukrainian government, is legitimate. Only 30% in Luhansk believed that it was legitimate. And it was substantially lower than in other parts of southeastern Ukraine. Southeastern Ukraine, which is in general very skeptical and negative about Euromaidan. But we saw that Donbass reacted very differently to, uh, to these events. Uh, and finally, I also agree with Lucan that uh, the crisis of political representation, the implosion of party of regions, transformed these uh, local movements not only in anti-Kiev movements and anti-Maidan movements, but also anti-local elite movements, anti-party of regions movements, anti-Akhmetov movements. Uh, we saw that very clearly in the way Akhmetov, for example, interacted with the protesters uh, in Donetsk when, they try, when he tried to calm them down one night, and they angrily responded that he should go away and take care of his own business. Uh, so the crisis of representation basically meant that, A, there is no authority higher than the protesters themselves above them. There is no one to rein them in. And second of all, that they need to organize their own uh, local uh, uh, councils, uh, local um, um, uh, groups uh, that will be running uh, these territories. Uh, the second level of explanation, I have two minutes. Uh, second level of consideration, I'll go very quickly, is the explanation on the re level of emotions. Uh, so I think two very important uh, perceptions, the perception of the risk of political discrimination that was very uh, peculiar to Donbass, um, uh, played a huge role, and it, both the language law, the reversal of the uh, language law, and the composition of the new government that was screwed in favor of Western Ukraine, that certainly played a role. And second of all, the perceived threat from nationalist groups that were termed as fascists or neo-Nazis, uh, uh, help to amplify this need to organize themselves, uh, to organize these self-defense groups on the local level. As I show in the paper, I go into details about the way secessionist movement was organized. It was not organized hierarchically. It was a parochial secessionist movement where each town had its own uh, self-defense local group, which was created around local strongmen. And if you look at the composition of the insurgency right now, you would see that they're facing big problems of collective action because every uh, every city, Horlivka is separate from Stakhanov, uh, they're basically not communicating with each other. It was not organized hierarchically, it was organized horizontally. Uh, and finally, I think to understand the sustain sustainability of insurgency, yes, uh, Russian uh, contribution on that level, on that, at that stage, 
played a huge role and decisive role, I would say. But to understand the sustainability of insurgency, we also need to understand the uh, type of uh, violence that was used by the Ukrainian side uh, in its counterinsurgency operations. And so the uh, A, reliance on paramilitary groups that uh, they used as vanguard groups uh, in, at the beginning of the operations that were uh, engaged in massive human rights abuses on the territories that got under their control. Uh, I mean, all of that is, is documented in Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc. All of that is not investigated by the Ukrainian government. It was not really brought up in the election campaign. Nobody talks about these violations. And second of all, of course, indiscriminate violence by the Ukrainian armed forces, the use of artillery, air power, multiple rocket launchers, and the denial, continuous denial by the Ukrainian authorities that this indiscriminate violence is used against densely populated civilian areas. If you look at any studies of the Civil War, you would see that these two elements, the way the counterinsurgents are treating civilian population or mistreating civilian population has a huge role in, in, in influencing the extent to which locals are willing to collaborate with the insurgents.